So good evening, Yertov from, from Jerusalem. Uh, I'm Rabbi Stacey Blank, the Director of Education and Leadership Development for the World Union for Progressive Judaism. And this is our latest webinar in a series of what we are attempting to do to help the world understand what's happening in Israel. We're now in our 50th day or 50, 50 something day uh, of this war. And we're sitting on edge. I don't know about all of you. Um, and this is the moment of passing the next round of hostages, Israeli hostages over to the Red Cross and hopefully back to Israel. So always oh, these tense, tense moments, these tense days. And we also are trying to be with a listening ear to what are the needs, what's happening around the world and how we can respond and help with that. And we do hope that especially um, today's webinar can, can be a part of that education process to help us. But before we get started with that, I do wanna take advantage uh, that there is a special mission in Israel this week of the URJ, Unit of Reform Judaism in North America, the Artsenu, the World Zionist Reform Body, and the World Union for Progressive Judaism. And our president, Rabbi Sergio Bergman, is a is one of the leaders of that delegation. I've had the privilege to join parts of it. And I'd like to invite Rabbi Bergman to just say a few words about what it is to be in Israel this week. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi Stacy. This is really a very important moment for all of us. And the idea of all the reform movement together, we can really be present here in solidarity with Israel, standing by the state of Israel. Also, we witness that the process to bring back the hostages is sacred work for Israel. And this is something that we are proud how Israel really honor the dignity and the sanctity of life. And on the other hand, so really hard to listen the survivors, people that was displaced. It's really strange to believe that it's true. And it's not a network that we are in Israel and we have refugees into Israel, inside Israel. It's really amazing and the loss that we have. But here we are, we never give up. We don't lose our hope to have that Iquateinu. And here we are together, like an extended family of the reform movement with our brothers and sisters in Israel. And in this night also, in this moment, with all of you worldwide to be together. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you. And even though we've had a ceasefire for the past few days, we know that the war is ongoing. And we're going to talk about tonight about that, I guess, cyber war, what's happening online. And if we look for a moment in our Jewish sources, um, our, our sources talk about responsibility, about what how we're supposed to behave, uh, and not so much how to respond to those who, uh, who engage in this harmful behavior. We can say, we can quote the Torah, which tells us that we should not put a stumbling block before the blind, uh, meaning that we should not try to impede people's ability in anything. The Torah teaches us that we should not lotonu ishit amito. We should not cause distress to our fellow. And the uh, rabbis tell us that includes using our words. Um, the Mishnah Torah, the Rambam tells us three times asur la adam litasek begnevat daat. A person is forbidden to deceive people. It is utterly forbidden. Gnevat daat asur. So. That's if we talk about ourselves. And we had uh, this week, also in the midst of a ceasefire, Elon Musk, the owner of X, formerly known as Twitter, visiting in Israel. And he came at a time when advertisers are pulling out of Twitter. He came to tour the Gaza envelope communities, met with families of hostages, met with Israeli government officials. And uh, it was very interesting, this uh, relationship. And maybe Rafi can also talk about that. And as I introduce Rafi Mendelson, who is the Vice President of Marketing at Sayabra, which is an Israel-based social threat intelligence company, 
Uh, if you read in the calculus uh, uh, online website of Yedir Echonot, you would learn that this company has uh, uncovered a bot network of over 40,000 fake profiles that are spreading pro-Hamas propaganda and fake news. And this content has received over 371,000 engagements and reached over half a billion profiles over the course of two days. So Rafi is joining us. He's going to share us the company's latest insights regarding disinformation related to the Israel-Hamas war. And Syabra, maybe you've seen them in the news. They were quoted in the New York Times, Reuters, Fox Business, Rolling Stones, Forbes, ABC News, NBC News, and more. So we're very happy. We're not happy that we have to talk about this, but Rafi, we're really happy to have you here to help and enlighten us and to teach us and hopefully help us to be more aware that we can that we can be activists wherever we are around the world. We're gonna start off with a presentation. You're welcome, if you have questions as they come up, you're welcome to write them in the chat, but we'll we'll relate to them when, when Rafi's presentation is, is over as we'll have time for, for Q&A. Thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Um, so I presume you can, I'll just continue. Um, I'm Rafi Mendelssohn. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, as you can hear from the accent, I'm originally from England, London, born and bred. Um, but I speak to you now from Israel, uh, where I am based and have been for the last 10 years. Um, I'm not a, a member of the progressive Judaism community, but I have uh, good friends and strong links, uh, especially in the UK with the Shires. I believe Miriam's on, on the call and the Langsfords as well. So uh, uh, really warm wishes and great to join you all today. Um, we're gonna be talking about disinformation on social media and there's been a huge amount of conversation on social media. Um, before that, uh, please leave in the chat um, where you're based. I'd love to see, see and get an idea of, uh, of where you are in the world and where people are joining us. And also as well, please leave your questions in the chat, raise your hands, uh, please be Israeli about it. Uh, and so leave uh, your questions. Um, I'm going to present some slides, uh, but it's not going to be so many slides. We're going to go through it quite quickly because I think it's more interesting if people have an opportunity to ask their questions and, and get an idea of maybe some of the confusion or some of the uh, thoughts uh, and ideas that they've been thinking about in terms of social media. And we can unpack this massive topic. Um, I'm sure, like, like me, uh, we've been following, even in Israel, but also around the world, we've been following the conflict a lot on social media, whatever platforms that we've been uh, on and following, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever we've been uh, uh, looking at, uh, and receiving our news from uh, social media. And so just a quick introduction about Syabra, the company that I work for. Um, like it was mentioned by the rabbi, I, I, uh, Syabra is a social threat intelligence company. Yeah, what does that mean? Uh, so actually, for the last five years, the company has been working with governments around the world and also large private companies to monitor social media and identify threats. So we've worked, for example, with the U.S. State Department to track foreign interference in elections. Uh, we've worked with uh, Taiwanese government to track vaccine disinformation. Uh, we work with governments to track protests. Um, and we also work with large private companies to identify uh, disinformation against them, uh, impersonations, um, and any kind of attacks that might be emerging from social media. Um, the company, you mentioned Elon Musk, uh, we actually were hired by Elon Musk last year as he was looking to acquire uh, uh, Twitter. Um, and one of our unique technologies at Syabra is our ability to identify fake accounts on social media. Two of our co-founders come from, stereotypically, the Info Information Warfare Units of the Israeli army. So you may have, may have heard of units like 8200, uh, Shimon Matayim, and 82 uh, elite intelligence units. And they come from those units as the many of my colleagues. And the platform that we have built uh, allows us to identify the activities of malicious actors, um, however, wherever they may, may be acting and for whatever motivation, whether it's power, influence, uh, or, or financial gain. And so we were hired by Elon Musk, who wanted to know, as he was looking to acquire Twitter, how many bots, how many fake accounts are there on social media? Uh, and Twitter at the time said 20%, uh, sorry, said 5%, he had said 20%. And actually we were hired to 
uh, to be able to track it. And for a few months, we worked with Elon Musk and his team uh, to uncover. It's the answer to that question is roughly between 11 to 14 percent of the conversations taking place on Twitter involve fake accounts. Uh, and so that gives you some some type of kind of barometer for the rest of uh, the, the the conversation that we're about to have. Um, and since he acquired Twitter, you know, we, we we haven't been working with Elon Musk, and we've been kind of bystanders like like everyone else. It's been interesting to see what the platform is doing, as well as the other platforms itself. So, in terms, that's an introduction to Cyabra. A lot of there's been a lot of conversation about social media and the way that people have been using social media and disinformation generally. Uh, the tone that we take on social media, what people are allowed to say. And I think all of those conversations are very valid and it's really important to have those kinds of conversations. The thing that we focus on at Cyber in particular, and we've been, as mentioned, been having lots of conversations with journalists around, is identifying and uncovering, monitoring specifically fake accounts. When I say fake accounts, those are bots, sock puppets, avatars, accounts that are not uh, uh, who they are saying that they are from. So they might be uh, coordinated, they might be run by a computer program, or they might be a human behind it who's actually writing text. But the person that they claim to be is not the person that they are. Uh, and fake accounts in particular um, should be treated uh, with uh, a lot of suspicion because they are, by their inherent nature, have been created for malicious intent. And so the process of identifying and seeing how fake accounts are acting allows us to see what the other side are doing, how they are acting. It also is important because often we go on social media and we have no idea who we're engaging with. They might say things that we oppose and we disagree with, and we don't know if that account is real or fake. And um, when we think of fake accounts, when we think of bots, we might be thinking of kind of obvious bots, bots that are trying to sell us something or scam us or sell us cryptocurrency. And those are the kind of dumb bots. But actually, the evolution of bots and fake accounts on social media has increased thanks somewhat to uh, different tactics, but also to the advent of AI uh, and generative AI technologies that make these bots more believable. Um, and so it's becoming harder to identify whether a fake account is, in fact, a fake account. So we are all engaging with fake accounts on a day-to-day -day uh, day -day basis on any given conversation. Um, and I think that's really important. And this conversation we're about to have today over the next half an hour or so is going to really be talking about specifically the aspect of fake accounts, what they're doing, how they are coordinating, what are the kind of false narratives that they're putting out, and what can we do to try and make sure that we're not falling for it or do something about it? And I think that's a really important aspect of it. It's like being in a room full of people and this big auditorium is having a really intense, heated debate. And that's really important to have a debate in today's society. But imagine a significant proportion. Imagine 25 percent of that room are not, in fact, people. They are mannequins. But we're still listening to what the mannequins have to say. And so that's a completely different conversation of us. At the very least, we should be able to understand what the mannequins, who the mannequins are, and be able to identify and separate from real from fake. And so that's what Cyabra does. Um, we often say that we, un we uncover the good, bad and fake of the online world. Um, and that's uh, what we're going to be talking through. So as a company, we this is what we do. When Russia invaded Ukraine, we were looking at Russian bots um, around the elections. In fact, the elections for next year, we've already started uncovering bot networks. Um, as a company, we are a venture-backed Series A uh, startup, uh, and most of our employees and our headquarters are, in fact, in Israel, in Tel Aviv, um, and we have some employees in, employees in the US. Um, but this is what we do. So when the war started, you can imagine this is our skill set. We already have created this technology. So we very quickly turned our attention to try and understand what is it that we are seeing about the conversation? And even a, just across the first two days, there's so much research and so much analysis that I could talk to you through with tonight that it would take hours and hours. So actually, I'm just going to focus on even just the first two days of the conflict to hopefully give everyone on this call an idea of the scale and the sophistication that what we're seeing on the other side. 
I hope I don't uh, um, you know, worry people too much because at the end, I think we're going to go through a couple of steps that people can take to try and guard themselves and protect themselves from the, 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 the worst of these dangers. Um, and so that's what we're going to delve into. So pretty much on day two or day three, we had completed scans and analysis of the first two days of the conflict. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. So I'm going to bring up uh, my screen. Um, please let me know. Uh, or, or I, I can't see the, the chat anymore, but please let me know if you can't see the screen. Um, and so this is from October. This is from the first two days um, and our cyber social media analysis. I'm not going to go through every single slide in great detail, but just to give you the summary, what we did is we analyzed the main conversation using all of these and more keywords and hashtags uh, terms so that we can try and capture across all of the main, the main social media platforms as much of the conversation that took place on the 7th and the 8th of October. We looked at nearly half a million profiles that engage in the conversation and those accounts put out uh, over 730,000 pieces of content. So that might be a post, a tweet, a comment, et cetera. Uh, and so that's what we uncovered in the first two days. Those are very high numbers, but it shouldn't be surprising because as the events unfolded over the first two days, we, uh, you know, we, we found ourselves going to, many of us found ourselves going to social media to truly try and understand and follow the conversation, right? So with that in mind though, as we were searching and going towards social media to see what is in fact going on, um, Sabra uncovered something pretty worrying. Uh, and that is that out of all of the profiles engaged in the conversation about Israel, Israel Hamas conflict and all, all of the related keywords as well, 25% of those accounts, one in four on the 7th and the 8th discussing the Israel Hamas conflict was in fact a fake account. That means that it had been created by someone in order to appear as real and it wasn't real. Um, and in fact, not just 25%, but these accounts of bots, these bot farms were coordinated pro Hamas that were aimed and designed at creating and putting, creating uh, content and putting out false narratives. And so there's a lot to unpack here. And when we talk about the word disinformation, many people think about, well, that's just fake news. But actually, when we use the word disinformation, that can include a huge range of influence operations, is what we call, uh, and that could be also different techniques and it isn't always, as we're about to see, the introduction of completely new fake news. It can be about just trying to shift people's opinion or trying to amplify one opinion in particular. But what we initially found is that one in four of the accounts in, on social media engaged in the conversation was in fact fake. So if we're thinking of that auditorium of people um, and we're engaging in that conversation or, or, or in fact we're just listening to what that auditorium of debate is taking place, 25% of that auditorium was a mannequin and was putting out information. We see the impact of those fake accounts. The impact uh, over just the first two days uh, is those uh, one in four had the potential reach of half a billion profiles across social media on those first two days. And we see some of the views, this is examples on TikTok, uh, some of the views reach tens of thousands. Uh, and these are all uh, from content and examples from fake accounts. We uncovered three types of narratives, which I'm gonna put out uh, and explain, talk you through now. And these are narratives that were put out by the accounts in their thousands. So the first narrative was talking about how now that there are Israelis that have been captured, uh, that people should expect the imminent release of prisoners, which, as we're now seeing over the last few days, is actually something that has happened and has materialized. But this is a false narrative that was put out in Arabic. So it's also worth bearing in mind that not all content you would have seen. Some of the content, the false narratives that was put out, was aimed at different audiences. And so this was a false narrative that we see being aimed at Arabic audiences in order to try and drum up support and get people supportive of it 
And this, I suppose, is a an ends justify the means. We are doing what we're doing in order to take hostages so that we can exchange them for the future release of prisoners. Um, again, that might be an opinion held by some, but this is an opinion that is being pushed out by fake accounts in the thousands, coordinated and organized by pro Hamas. One thing to that you might be thinking is where does this come from? Where are they based? It's always incredibly difficult to know exactly where this is based, but we can see from the evidence and from the scale and sophistication of the research that we've uncovered that uh, this is a very sophisticated, almost a state level actor type of org level of organization that we're seeing here. So you know, make that uh, what you will. The second narrative was looking at and pushing out the narrative of praising the Hamas terrorists by talking about the compassion and the humanity that they are showing to the hostages. This is a video that many of you will recognize. Fortunately, this is a, a mother and her two children. They have not yet been released. Um, but what we are seeing here, and the number of views is incredibly high, what we're seeing here is actually a really sophisticated uh, technique that what we've uncovered here is something called DIP, deceptive imagery persuasion. Now that is not creating whole new fake images, fake videos, and putting out fake news. DIP is taking something that is real, taking something that exists, but recontextualizing it. So you may recognize this video. This video is not disinformation. This video actually took place on the 7th of October. It was recorded on the GoPros, on the cameras of Hamas terrorists themselves. But they have been clipped and only a small segment of that video was then taken. It was then recontextualized and was put out accompanied by text to show that uh, that the terrorists are peaceful, that they're compassionate, that they're that, you know, showing humanity towards the hostages, and it's being pumped out in the thousands by fake accounts. And this is an example of a fake account. And so this was a second narrative that was put out. It's worth bearing in mind that the first narrative, it's likely that it was planned in advance. But this narrative couldn't have been planned in advance because it's taking video that took place on the 7th. And on the same day, fake accounts are pumping out that content that had been recorded that same day. So the speed at which the fake accounts adjusted and con uh, conducted, wrote their content and pumped it out was incredibly high. Um, this may have been content that you would have seen. Look at how compassionate. Or in fact, it may be content that you're seeing now or a narrative that you're seeing now that's being amplified. The seeds of that narrative was sown on the 7th straight away. And so the resources uh, and the sophistication that was required by those malicious actors who were acting behind all of those thousands of fake accounts um, was incredibly sophisticated because on the day they had to take the recording, decide what to clip, decide what to uh, add as a false narrative, and then decide which accounts of the thousands that were gonna be used to, to pump out this information. And so this was another false narrative and the third and final false narrative that we see is the perceived hostilities by the Israeli police on the uh, Al-Aqsa uh, uh, grounds. Um, and uh, I suppose, again, here is a ends justify the means. This is content both in English and in Arabic. So it was aimed at both audiences um, around the world. And it was, you know, we had no choice. We had to we had to do this because of uh, um, the the actions of uh, of of the uh, Israelis um, on Al-Aqsa. Again, this is not made up video, but it's video that's being taken and it's amplifying a specific view, but it's being amplified by fake accounts in the thousands. Uh, and so you can see the content from the fake profiles mentioning Alexa reached over seven and a half million potential views. And that's just in the first two days. Um, so again, you may now see on social media, uh, this narrative or this opinion held by lots of people, you may see it on the streets if, on, if there's a protest or if there are people that you're speaking to and that they might hold this opinion. But we can see that this opinion was popularized or, or the seeds or it was amplified during the first two days of the conflict. This is one example of a fake profile and we'll pretty much conclude on this before we move to uh, questions. And I just wanted to share an example of a fake account to show the sophistication. This is Rebel Taha. 
uh, on Twitter. And we've identified him as an inauthentic profile. The account was created uh, in March 2022. So a year and a half ago, this account was created with the intent of it one day being put into the online battlefield, the cyber battlefield, and to be able to put into action. And in that year and a half, the account hadn't done much. It was pretty much laying dormant, ready to be put into action. And on the 7th, we suddenly saw all these accounts being switched on and being turned on, being used for the purposes of their false narratives. And so accounts that had been created a year and a half ago also not just shows us, as we saw before, the level of sophistication, the scale of the resources required and the speed, but also the planning that went into this. Unfortunately, on the ground and the evidence that's coming out now, we see that this operation, this attack was planned months, years in advance. And actually what we see is on the online battlefield, this is also the case. Um, this is something that's plan been planned, been in the planning for many, many months, many years. Um, and, uh, and so this isn't a, a spur of the moment, a decision uh, that was taken recently. Um, and we can see the evidence and the planning of it. There is a physical on the ground battleground, but there is also an online battleground as well that everyone here is, uh, is experiencing and is seeing for themselves with their own eyes. Uh, and so this is an example of an account that was created a year and a half ago. And once it was turned on, it tweeted over 600 times in two days. It's continued to tweet on that level as well. Um, in fact, the last time I checked it a few days ago, it was still in existence. It hadn't been taken down. So these fake accounts are still around. They're still pumping out their false narratives, which gives an indication to the social media platforms and the, um, the actions that they take or inactions that they take uh, to deal with this kind of problem. Um, and so that's a little bit uh, of the research and analysis that we uncovered. Um, before we go to questions, um, I hope I'm not, well, I hope I've opened people's eyes as to the scale of the problem and what we're seeing here. And I think there are a couple of things that we as a society, as we engage in social media, uh, the steps that we can take, um, especially when the kind of imagery that we're seeing is so emotive um, and sometimes it's purposefully emotive in order to uh, uh, get a reaction from us. And so I think one of the bits of advice that some people have asked me, what can I do on social media? Um, how can I make a difference? And I think one of the things that people can do, and it might sound a bit counterintuitive, is to actually take a minute. If you are seeing something before you engage in an account, take a minute to actually scrutinize a little bit further what you're seeing, but also go onto the account that you're about to engage with and see, does it in fact look suspicious? Are there signs of inauthentic activity? Has this account posted uh, as over 600 times? Um, what are the kind of narratives that they're putting out? Um, and that's incredibly powerful because we all, feel the need to respond and make a difference but in fact if we're, who we're making a difference who we're responding to is a bot then we're wasting our time um, and so if you take that extra minute and you identify actually i think this account isn't even real then a don't engage and b try and report to get it taken down uh, and over you know if enough people try and do that uh, then that can that can make a difference so there's a lot more that I can cover. There's a lot more I can talk about. Um, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to listen to me. Um, happy to open it up to, uh, to questions. Okay, Rafi, thank you. And yeah, as you say, this information, it, it just, uh, it's so distracting. <laughs> Even more, you know, in addition to all the war, and you really see how thought out it is that that there is a war, this sense of warfare that's not just on the battlefield, but it is in, it's in our minds, it's in our screens. And I think that a lot of us feel the effect of it when they are around the world and they we see people maybe see in their hometowns or we see in college campuses uh, and on the news, these demonstrations and these um, uh, slogans that people are repeating. And you ask, you know, where does this information coming from um so maybe i'll start off with a question and then uh, and then we'll, we'll as people put some questions in the chat or, or raise their hand and, and speak up themselves um i don't know if this is in the realm of your research do 
you know, how how do we do we see the the jump from from the pages of social media to to let's say protests uh, or in the newspaper or how things are reported? Yeah, so th there's a really um, strong link, um, and, and we sometimes refer to it at Cyber as from post to protest. We've seen this in other places around the world. Yeah, we saw this during the um, the Arab Spring, where a lot of the activity, the hashtags, the planning took place on social media and then kind of materialized or organized itself. Um, some of the slogans that you see also um, uh, do that. And so, uh, so yeah, so there is a direct correlation. Um, not just that, but recently, I mentioned that I can't go through all of the research that we've uncovered. But in fact, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the conversations around the pro-Palestinian protest marches in London specifically. And we found around that conversation, about 15% of that conversation was driven by fake accounts. So it's not just a case of putting out a false narrative by malicious actors about the conflict itself. The level of sophistication we're seeing is such that it can pop up around different narratives. It can pop up around other topics around the world and it can actually go quite local and specific. So not just are we seeing the impact on the ground in terms of public opinion, in terms of protests, but also we see those some of those fake accounts are actually engaging and trying to encourage those rallies in the first place. Okay. All right, so we have a question here and um, it's from Sheila. So Sheila, tell me if you wanna um, expand on this question that you wrote a lot of Palestinian flags on Facebook, are they fake? So that's a very good question. Looking at the profile itself, when you don't see a clear name, maybe it's a few characters or some numbers, or if you don't see their face, that can be a telltale sign that the account is fake. At Cyabra, we look at hundreds, between six to 800 different behavioral parameters using semi-supervised machine learning to basically understand if an account is showing inauthentic activity. So we look at the regularity of, you know, if someone's posted 600 times in two days, that doesn't look like authentic behavior. But so too, we look at the profile that they've created. If it's got a flag, if it's, that can also be one of the telltale signs uh, to be able to look at. So yeah, that's a really good indication um, of what people should be looking out for, as well as, you know, like I mentioned, you go on the account, you can see their profile, you can see the kind of people that they, uh, that they engage with, you can see the kind of topics. If all they're talking about is the conflict, um, and nothing else, and that's also a sign. Thank you. All right, so Claudia talks about the video that you posted uh, with Baby Kfir and said it had a blue verification tag. Was that uh, a fake account or or was the video fake? Fake. So it can be it can be fake. Um, it can be probably one of two things. It's either uh, they have purchased the blue tick. You don't need to be verified anymore. You can just acquire. Uh, the 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 blue uh, check mark now I believe it's called um, and that allows your content to be seen higher than others um, and so that's not an indication that actually is an indication if it's a fake account that it's quite a sophisticated fake account or in fact it's a it's kind of more of an avatar or a sock puppet not to get too nerdy in the disinformation world but what you might have is a few uh, avatars kind of the leading ones but then it and they're putting out content and then it's amplified by hundreds of fake accounts. And so there's a relationship between the different types of fake accounts. The second thing it could be is, and I, it's not clear enough in front of me, is sometimes we see with fake accounts, the blue tick is part of the image of the profile itself. Sometimes we see this on Facebook as well. So it does look like they've acquired the blue check mark, but in fact, it could be um, because there's some text next to it as well. I'm bringing it up here. It could be part of the image of their profile, and they've actually photoshopped the blue check mark in there in order to give themselves the semblance of uh, of authenticity. Another example of the ways that people are, be, are trying to fool you. Oh, okay, so Alan asks, how can we encourage fact checking so that such postings are fake and promote misinformation, uh, or to that? To, to, to tell people, how can we maybe, should we be engaging in education that to tell people who maybe quote us these kind of information, how to uh, how to help them to do fact checking without them thinking we're a propaganda machine ourselves? It's a great question. Fact checking is incredibly important, but isn't very, very difficult. And it's only becoming 
more difficult with the pumping out of information thanks to generative AI. Actually, throughout the talk so far, I haven't spoken about fact-checking. And in fact, Cyber doesn't do fact-checking. The organizations and people that do fact-checking is incredibly important. Um, but it's it's like sometimes you feel like you're constantly chasing you know, a bag in the wind. Like it's just impossible to, to, to be able to do that. But then also I would refer you back to the original point that, yeah, maybe we feel the need, uh, uh, the compulsion to fact check. But actually what we're fact checking is a fake account. And actually trying to engage in the content of a fake account only helps their cause because their engagement levels go up. And so therefore their content, thanks to the algorithms of these platforms, is then seen by more people. So I would, in our mind, and this is the way that we think about it in the disinformation world, I would separate, and this is the, the ABC of disinformation, the accounts, the behaviors, and the content. Look at the accounts. Is the account real? Is it fake? Uh, does it look like it's a real person? And then try and separate that from the content of what they're saying, if it's text, images, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, look at the content, and you might be drawn in by the videos, some of the horrific images or videos, or the sub facts that just may be completely untrue. But I would pause on the C, on the content, and check on the A, and just double check whether this account looks real or not before you even engage in the C. Because you could spend all day every day. We could have an army. We might lose anyway because of just the sheer numbers involved in this type of conversation. Um, we could engage with it all day every day. But in fact, maybe most of the fact checking that we're doing is fake accounts who are primed and ready, as we saw, ready in advance to pump out fake information in any way. Um, so fact checking is good, but I think it has to be done when, we're, when we know that we're engaging with real people. Thank you. Can continue if you have more questions. Um, I have a question, you know, because you know, we in the the reform progressive movement, we also uh, encourage to be self critical, uh, with love, uh, but to 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 not to always make things, you know, that we're always how that we're the wonderful ones. So, do you do any research about um, fake accounts or fake news uh, that are pro Israel? And if so, is there any information regarding that? So, so I'm not saying it doesn't exist, um, but we haven't really seen it to any significant scale. And I think that's not surprising, considering when we look at how we were surprised and caught short, um, we were also caught short in the online sphere and we're even further behind. Now, I'm not advocating that we create fake accounts in order to fight fake accounts. I don't actually think that's the right way to do it. Um, I think it's, like I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, there is a, a good conversation to be had about airing out voices. You know, lots of people can say what they want and, and you know, social media is today's town square and that's where good, healthy, of course, it has to be healthy and, and, and considerate debate needs to take place. But at the very least, you should know that the person you're speaking to is a person. And increasingly, that's not the case. And we're not even aware that that isn't even the case. And so it's OK to give our opinion as long as it's considerate and you know, done in a respectful way. That's my opinion. Um, but the fact that we are being influenced and to even take a step back outside of the conflict, there are so many different topics an increasing number of fake accounts engaged in any topic any mundane conversation about glasses headphones might have on average three to five percent of that conversation driven by fake accounts so it's happening on a day-to-day -day basis um and just being aware or or you know being more alert or as a society we should be aware of the damage that fake accounts is having on any given conversation mm -hmm. no i say it also because because we're we're we hear I'm sure many of us hear also that um, people say that the news coming out of Israel is fake, or you know that the perhaps some of the massacres didn't happen, or or the atrocities were you know you're 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 creating that fake news, uh, or that you know how Israel is publicizing is it winning the war, you know that those those kinds of things that I think come up for for all of us. I think um, we should we should try and uh, and focus and rely on healthy news sources. You know, news sources that we that we know uh, and we believe have gone, you know, taking rigorous steps to to do the best that they can to check that the sources are true. Um, 
yeah, probably we should take with a pinch of salt what someone we've never met on social media says, um, however much we might feel compelled to respond to that. Um, so I think we should have our, our sources of information that we feel that we can trust um, to speak to people on the ground as well, I think is really important. And it's good and it's healthy for us to be critical of what we're reading and to not just look at one source and to read around and to take multiple opinions. I think that's the sign of a healthy society. Um, so that's we should co continue to do that. Thank you. Um, also, regarding the, the 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 fact of who's behind this, um, is it the question is how how much you know how much how how much resources does it take to create to create these fake accounts and to do the things you described, putting out uh, six hundred messages a day. Um, is is that something that any hacker could do? You just have to have a lot of time in your hands, or is it something you you mentioned the involvement perhaps of of even perhaps governments? I, how do you measure what the investment is of, of a person or an entity into these fake accounts, uh, and then to, so we can understand the magnitude and the potential uh, threat? Just forget this war of anything going on in the world, like you mentioned elections. Uh, how much does this threaten? I guess world order, or how, or how we influences our information, so the meaning of information. You, absolutely. So I can tell you, it's much easier than we realize to be able to create fake accounts at scale. Now, the sophistication that we're seeing involves resources and people and planning, and you know, so some some campaigns are small and not as effective, and some, like we're seeing here, are bigger. Um, and I can tell you, it's certainly cheaper than buying tanks and planes and. And that's what makes it so effective. And that's why we're seeing such an explosion in disinformation regarding world events um, you know, on any election war topic um, that we might be uh, uh, engaged in. Um, so, yeah, it's nowhere near as expensive as, as you know, people might think. Um, it's becoming more sophisticated. The tools, thanks to generative AI, allows malicious actors to be able to come across as more believable. It allows bots to speak to bots um and to to fool people to an even greater extent um so it's having a a big impact this is a this is a large a very big problem um and it's there is like i mentioned a, a battleground taking place on the ground and then there is also an online uh, battleground um and unfortunately i would love to say that we are winning that war um but i'm not sure we are okay. we have another question here from alan how important is x formerly twitter to the source of false accounts? What other big players are there and how much of their contribution to false accounts? Like, you know, is it is it X, Instagram, Facebook, are there, what what should we be looking out, out for and where? The, the answer is yes, all of the above. Um, a lot of people talk about X, Twitter, um, and they're interested in it and, and it's being covered a lot by journalists. A lot of the journalists that I speak to are interested in asking questions specifically about that. And we do see a lot of fake accounts on, on Twitter um, and the ability to create fake accounts on mass on X is, is not particularly difficult. But at the same time, um, that's not giving a free pass to the other social media platforms. And if you're a malicious actor, you want to go where the eyeballs are. Uh, and there are many platforms where there are hundreds of millions billions of people every single day engaging. So you're not just going to draw your attention and focus your efforts just on Twitter. You're going to be doing that across all of the main social media platforms, but you might adjust your tactics slightly differently. TikTok, because of the nature of the algorithm and the videos that are shown, we saw right from the beginning, from the seventh, the kind of videos, the emotive, really distressing videos. If we keep our finger on our thumb, that half a second or one second longer on those kind of videos, the algorithm then gets to work and it shows us more of that content. Facebook, when we talk about fact checking and content, there's a they they're proud to say that they have an army of fact checkers. Uh, but actually, if we look at which languages those fact checkers are focused on, um, there is I think it's less than thirty percent of the content on Facebook is actually in English, and over eighty percent of the fact checkers or the content checkers. Are, are focused on English. So there's a disproportionate amount of resources going into the English language. And as I showed you, one of the false narratives was in Arabic. So there are smaller uh, resources going into checking in Arabic or in other languages. And that allows false narratives, that allows disinformation to spread all around the world. You know, social media is not just an English 
uh, uh, platform where people in English uh, uh, communicate. It's uh, all around the world. Um, and so I would say that all of the platforms are are, are struggling, let's put it diplomatically, uh, in their own ways. So, so you provide this, you do this research and you provide this information to, you know, governments or to organizations, you know, different bodies. Um, do you see what they do with this information? What impact having this information has? And, and if, if there are any changes or, or uh, if there aren't, what, what, if you have uh, thoughts about what you think should be done? So we work on the government side, we work with intelligence units who use um, our platform to be able to collect information, analyze the same way that, that we've just shown you here. And then often they will provide that information and share that information with an internal unit. So we don't always see what happens next and, and, and privy to that. Um, with governments, it's, it's easier for them to get um, malicious accounts taken down because they often have a direct line with the social media platforms. Um, with private companies, it's it's a challenge. They themselves are also using our platform to see you know, what attacks are taking place on the company, what disinformation, what impersonation accounts of the company um, uh, that we're seeing or impersonations of senior executives as well. Um, something that we see when there are attacks against executives or employees of companies they tend to happen employees of companies and also public officials they tend to happen these attacks tend to happen disproportionately against women uh, and minorities as well uh, and so that's something that is that is happening in society people who are going about their daily business or in a position of responsibility and all of a sudden they are being attacked to quite a high extreme not, i'm not just talking about some negativity maybe their personal details are being leaked or photos of them with their family uh, and so we are working with organizations who want to start to stay on top of what's happening and then they can take the relevant steps that they need to, whether it's cybersecurity solutions, whether it's working with law enforcement authorities, whether it's approaching and working with the social media platforms to get this kind of stuff taken down. You mentioned, oh, here is a question from Han Hannah. Sorry if I say your name wrong. Have you done any research into how much our teenagers and young adults, or that she called the digital natives, affected by misinformation? So we haven't done research specifically on that audience, but there is a huge amount of research of how social media platforms are uh, impacting young adults um, and teenagers. And, uh, and so it's very easy to find. Um, some of that research comes from the platforms themselves who haven't been uh, forthcoming in sharing that information, but eventually it has been. There's lots of information uh, and research done by Meta uh, on the impact of especially young girls uh, that are using Instagram and the impact that that's had on them and their self-esteem and their mental health and awareness. Um, and so that's there's a, unfortunately a lot of research and, and so we haven't we haven't had to add to that body and there's uh, plenty to for us to see. Uh, unfortunately, not always pleasant reading. Yeah. Uh, Sheila asks, when I share important information on Facebook, how can I get to wider audiences than just friends? I put it on public. So Facebook is going to be more of a challenge for you because of the inherent nature of Facebook as a platform, because you have your communities, um, your, your group of friends. So it's most likely that your group of friends are going to see it, possibly the wider circle. If your intention is to get the information out to much wider audiences, then it's better to use other platforms. If it's video content uh, images, then TikTok. If it's other type of content, you can tap into the hashtags using uh, Twitter, X. Um, and so Facebook is, is meant for you to uh, congregate around your community or around special interests um, to be able to do that. And so we hear of the echo chambers um, and on Facebook, that's often the case that we're speaking to our friends and we're putting out information that we think is really important. But just be aware of the the way that some platforms work compared to other platforms. And I think that's really important to, to kind of arm ourselves about that knowledge of how they work and what those limitations and benefits are before we spend so much of our time and energy into trying to do uh, something that may not actually occur. Okay, Adrian asks, uh, in your opinion, uh, this company, the social media companies platforms, are they cooperating to eliminate these accounts? And I would tie that into I, one of the purposes I thought I understood of the Israeli government bringing Elon Musk here was try to get him to cut down on 
I know anti-Semitism content, uh, I don't know if that includes also fake accounts and, and bots uh, on, on X. So, you know, what is what are the social medias doing? Are they doing enough? Pass. Um, no, they're not. They're not. Uh, I, I, I try to be diplomatic and it's important at Sarah that we're objective about it. We we like to present the analysis to everyone and not, you know, we're not a stick to beat the platforms with. This is a, a big problem. Uh, but no, um, social media platforms, the way that they monetize is by showing um, adverts to their users, to their profiles, uh, and they are able to monetize whether they are showing uh, commercials, adverts to profiles that are real or fake. Um, and so you can see their motivation uh, might not be there to cut down the amount of fake accounts that are being created in their tens of thousands. Uh, and so there is, look, let me put it this way, there's probably more, a lot more that can be done. Uh, and that's putting it mildly. So maybe um, if there are, of course, if there are more questions, we have time, but kind of for me, the kind of the summing, summing up question is after hearing all of this and we're gathering knowledge, we're not seven Ishma, we're hearing and now we want, we want to do. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned some tools that we can do as individuals to, you know, to, to, to block accounts or not, you know, not to, not to participate in their information, to ask them, you know, to, to report them, to have, be, to be blocked. Those are, you know, on a one one case by case basis, are are there things have you seen uh, have examples of this taking place in the world, or you might imagine what kind of large scale advocacy might be? If like for example, we as a movement, uh, whether in our local countries or as a worldwide movement, would take this on as an issue. Um, do you have any thoughts about how to go about that? So unfortunately, there aren't really the tools on mass, especially unless you have very large resources to be able to spend on this kind of thing um, but you know there are uh, how many people on this uh, uh, there are 29 participants in this uh, conversation and all of us I'd imagine spend a fair whack of time on social media and so actually I think you know to possibly end on a positive I think we can have an impact uh, if we all um, make our small mark individually um, on each of the individual platforms if you think that there are accounts that are uh, inauthentic and fake accounts then that can have uh, and then we report them on near or next to um, across all the platforms uh, uh, next to the profile is there will be a button there that allows you to report um, you know, an account uh, and so that can have a big impact uh, and if we all do that and we'll continue to do that and um, that that will have an impact I believe um, whether it's going to win the war, I'm not so sure. Whether there are steps needed by the platforms, by governments, by you know, various stakeholders in society, I think that's probably going to have a bigger impact. But we can still do something as we go about our day-to-day -day business and engage in this conversation. Uh, maybe, in fact, rather than responding, you know, finding out those fake accounts and reporting them and trying to get them taken down is just as effective. Okay, thank you. I see, I see we have a final final camera. I just say, just don't be on social media, right? Save yourself a lot of agony. Uh, but it is, it is the, the blessing and the challenge of modernity. And that's also one of our uh, one of our credos as the progressive movement that we we take modernity head on, we take the blessings and we recognize that there are challenges. And another quote that comes to my mind. Uh, from our sources from, from the book of Deuteronomy says, Hanistarot la Adonai Eloheinu vaniglot lanu ulevaneinu ad olam lasot et kol divrei Torah azot. That the mysteries are things that we just can't know and that's that's for God and we're supposed to know the revealed things and offer that to our children forever and try to bring Torah, the, the good, the good to, to light. And and in this modern world, and in any any time, it's never clear what is truth, what is false, what is the right way. There, we also say there are many different paths. Uh, but especially when we're in a situation like we are in today, when we really feel like bnei or nege bnei the light that against the dark, when we see the atrocities that that our people have suffered, and knowing that we're there are wars and conflicts like this around the world. That, that this definitely is um, is something we need to fight against, whether it is God, please take care of our soldiers 
in the battlefield, but but that we ourselves uh, engaged in in the social media and at least having heightened awareness and, and hopefully that we can share that with our allies. A lot of what we talk about now is also um, that when we go out and and we we hear information from people, they share things that we know to be wrong, how to enlarge the dialogue and how to reach out to to our allies who are Jews and and non-Jews and to uh, and to engage and to hopefully bring um look what is the truth and what this truth is always somewhere in between but to to hear each other and to uh, to be able to engage not in extremist divisive information which i think is a, what happens on social media but to bring people together and to to hear each other and to God willing, resolve conflict. Thank you very much, Rabbi, for having me on. And if, if you permit me, I'm really sorry for just uh, taking one more minute of people's yeah. time. Um, uh, over the last uh, few weeks, as well as you know, doing, as as you've heard just now, um, myself, in, in my spare time, myself and, uh, and some of my friends have uh, also taken on an initiative to try and reach as many uh, soldiers in the fields where they are and to barbecue, to grill for them and feed them and give them a good meal. So if you allow me, and I had apologies because I mentioned yes, this before, beforehand, I've, I've left in the chat, I've left in the comment uh, a couple of links um, of information of what we've been doing. We fed over 4,000 soldiers so far, uh, and we've reached um, all of them either in the south, right by the borders, um, or as they're coming out of Gaza to be able to feed them a meal, um, or we've been in the north, right by the borders there, uh, where the where it's actually very, very tense uh, still. Um, and so I've left a couple of links. If anyone wants to uh, support this initiative, it's just all volunteer-based, uh, and in our spare time, I, I'm not, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm joining you here tonight. Uh, but the, there are two separate groups of my uh, of my uh, friends who are going to feed soldiers out in the field where they are, and to try and raise their spirits uh, and give them a warm meal. Um, and anyone who would like to support, uh, I appreciate that, and I've left the links for you to do so. Ravi, thank you so much. That was absolutely appropriate for you to share. You just lifted our spirits by by sharing that with us and uh thank you for sharing the important work that you're doing in Sayabra and we'll all start to follow follow that work and uh and be more aware uh thank you everyone for joining if you want to follow this discussion we'll be posting the the video on our YouTube channel and look forward to more of our webinars. And if you have ideas, more things that you'd like to know about or get resources for, let us know and we'll bring it to the world. Uh, right now we have on our calendar uh, in December, December 20th, our next roundtable discussion about what it means for the world union as a world to be a community and to support the idea of community, what how community can support us. And I'm sure we'll have some more things before then. So thank you, everybody. Stay safe, stay aware. We pray for Israel, for our hostages to return home. Hashavat Shalom al Shalom, shalom. Amen. Thank you very much. Shalom, shalom.